Good vibes as always, and welcome back to the Political Puff Podcast. Brother Push. Yes, yes, Brother Fitz. As always, thank you. How you doing today, my brother? Oh, man, man. Trying to make it through it, you know, uh, the world changing every day. Yes, it is. You know, it's changing every day. They keep telling us uh, the days that we had before aren't going to be the same. So, you know, trying to adjust to whatever changes that uh, the powers that be is trying to bring upon. <laughs> Absolutely. And and speaking of change, uh, a change in subscribers has also uh, happened with us. Thank you for those who have oh, yes. continued to subscribe to the Political oh, yes. Podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you. And let's not also forget Brother True. Hey, 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 how you doing? Brother True, thank yes, you again yes. also for joining us. Always a pleasure to have you in the building, my brother. How's it going with you, man? Oh, it's going pretty all right. You ready to get into this lesson? Yes, I am. Because, folks, I'm telling you right now, <laughs> this one right here, and I know I always probably say this, but is this, this is just another powerful lesson, man. This is going, but this is one that's, that's a heavy, this is a, for yes. heavy hitters right here. This is for heavy hitters. This one today is titled, what God does Paul serve? Yes. What right? God does Paul serve? Now, Brother Push, can you get, <laughs> just just let us in on to what is, is got you asking this question right here? Well, in a previous video that was done, you know, we talked about how Paul doesn't believe in the cross. So we wanted to kind of further go into that right there because you know to say such a thing even though you know i felt like you know we we proved that argument out pretty good but i wanted to go a little further in this because not only does paul does not believe in the cross he also admits that he doesn't speak with wisdom and there's another part i believe in Verses that maybe verse 19 of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 19, where it's actually being said of his God destroying wisdom inside of the world. You know, so it was kind of interesting to hear Paul say, you know, he doesn't talk to you with wisdom. And then to hear his God talk about destroying wisdom. So... We're going to show the scripture where all this conversation is coming from. So this scripture piece will go from uh, verse 17, Corinthians 17, to Corinthians 25, 1 Corinthians 25. Um, real quick, one other thing. We wanted to go to the Old Testament. Basically to look for what wisdom was in the Old Testament, you know, because I'm going to show some comparisons, like there is a parallel. There's something that is wrong with how wisdom is looked at in one portion of the book and how wisdom is looked at in another portion of the book. So, so happily, this wisdom part is dealing with Paul, but we're going to go into the Old Testament just to read just maybe three pieces just to kind of get an idea of how wisdom is looked at in the Old Testament. So, Brother Fitz. So this is Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 21. Mm -hmm. The wise in heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of the lips increaseth learning. There's nothing wrong with that right there. And lastly, another one from Proverbs, chapter 18, verse 15. The heart of the prudent getteth knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. Now, I had him read that right there so we can just kind of get an understanding of how we're taught wisdom is. You know, wisdom is it's non-destructible. You know, uh, when one says uh, there's evil wisdom, I don't believe in, like, evil wisdom. I think that that person is clever, but it's not wisdom, you know, because wisdom 
doesn't allow you to be destructive because the wise part about it is for it to exist or for no harm to come about. Wisdom will figure out a way, you know, um, versus someone who, say, is wise about the dark things that they do, you know. So I would consider that to be clever right there. So we're going to look right now into the chapter right here. That's 1 Corinthians 17. And we're just going to read that little part right here. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, I want y'all to notice something real quick. At the end, Brother Fitz, what was there at the end after gospel? There is a colon. That is important right there. Most of us, when we read the Bible, we read the whole thing as one. Like there was no commas or there was no periods there, like a run-on sentence. Actually, that piece right there is considered to be a codex. You know, like uh, when I first started a corporation and I didn't know how to do my bylaws, me and my wife would go and look at other people's bylaws and we would grab you know, uh, a line off of one bylaw, a, not a line off another bylaw, until you had a full conversation that said what you needed it to say. The same thing with the Bible. When you see those semicolons right there, when you see those right there, you have to halt. You can't continue to read. You have to halt right there because that is almost like a period, you know, most people just keep reading. So when we see those right there, we're going to hold and then we're going to analyze that area right there because that is considered to be a codex. So one more time, Brother Fitz. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. But to preach the gospel. So he's saying he comes to, pre to preach the gospel, but not to baptize. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. See, the important part, not with wisdom of words. Not with wisdom of words. So let's start from the top again and look at those semicolons. Let's pay attention. Let's look at that. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. See, you stop there. Then you look at the rest. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. He is essentially saying he does not come to baptize, but to preach the gospel. But he's saying he doesn't preach it with wisdom of words. And then he tells you because least the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Meaning that if he told you the truth, the cross, you wouldn't believe in it. Because the truth is, no one died on the cross. But we'll show you that later down the line. But right now, he's saying, not with wisdom of words, least the cross of Christ should be made none effect. None effect. If you're going to tell me that you're not talking to me with wisdom of words, and then you turn around and you tell me, you know, the reason why. Why is he saying least the cross will be made of none effect? Because it would not make sense to you if he talked to you wisely. So how I would interpret it is I've got to talk to you in a, a, a coded way or a parable for me, for you to understand the cross. If I don't, you, you won't get it. Or simply that he needs you to, you know. But he needs um, you to believe. And it also has this T right up here, and it says right there at the bottom with the T at that it means void, to void it out. Yes. And if you read that, even with that, it says, not with wisdom of words, least the cross of Christ should be made of non-effect. And if you notice that T right there, we'll be showing it in the screen. It says void, least the cross of Christ should be made void. That means that he has to lie to you in order to get you to believe it, to believe the cross. 
you have to go through this slowly. That's why I said that dot comma, that dot dot, that semicolon allows you to see that word not. And that starts to put a problem with this because this guy is literally telling you he's not talking to you with wisdom of words. Okay, so let's look at 18 because this is interesting in 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Stop. You see that again? There's a semicolon right there. You have to stop. You cannot read that like it's all one. That says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. <clears throat> but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. But the point I want y'all to see for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. What is that saying right there? That if if you don't believe in in Christ or the cross, then you are foolish. So those that preach the gospel are out to perish this foolishness that you don't know about Jesus. Basically, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. When you go out, and you preach the cross to someone who is not as knowledgeable as you, you believe that you are perishing the foolishness of them not knowing who this Christ is that you know. It's like as if you bumped into a person and you said, hey, man, Jesus love you. And he looks back at you and says, yeah, man, I heard about that right there. And then you look and you start telling him about Jesus. Well, that's you perishing foolishness. But you have to take it back up to what Paul said from the beginning. Chapter 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. See, he literally said, I did not come to baptize, but I came to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words least the cross of Christ would be made of none effect. So what he's saying is, is I came to preach the gospel, but I didn't tell you the truth because you wouldn't believe in the cross. I need you, and this is 18, I need you to believe in the cross so you will go out there and perish foolishness, basically make believers. That's literally what he just said. He's not talking to you with wisdom about the cross. He's not telling you the truth about the cross because he needs you to go out there and preach the cross to other people. He needs you to go out there and perish foolishness. Basically, you will feel, based off his lie that he's saying, like you're going out there and bringing people to truth or to light. You know? So, when we look down... At the next part, that's right underneath it, but unto us, Brother Fitz. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So we want to look at 18 again, because there's something interesting. He said, them and us. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, is to them that perish foolishness, but to us. But to us, which are saved, uh, is the one that's not perishing foolishness, they're not saved? So there's a clear separation that he's discussing right there. It says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. So you go out, you preach it to people who don't know the scriptures or the Bible the way that you do. And you believe in your mind, you're perishing foolishness because you're bringing them to light. But the thing is, is he turns around and says, but unto us, which are saved, it is the power of God. So now that makes you question what God does Paul serve? Because in verse 17 of Corinthians, he's saying, I've come not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And then he continues to say, not with wisdom of words. And you're like, well, why are you preaching the gospel not with wisdom of words? 
And he's like, well, because the cross would be of none effect. Basically, you wouldn't believe in it if I talked to you with wisdom, if I told you the truth. So 18 comes down. He's needing you to go out and perish foolishness. He needs you to go out there and perish foolishness or spread the word, the cross that he doesn't believe in. And then you get down to this next line, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. What God does Paul serve? See, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, Paul's God is a man. Um, he serves a king that he reveres as a god. The, just the same way as how people did Zeus. He serves a king who has a title that's higher than the word king. There's a title, so that title would be God. There's a title even for a queen, mother goddess. There are titles that are higher than a king. There's these spiritual titles that, you know, these priests give these people. So when you're looking at this, it's a man. The Most High would not have Paul go out and lie to you so that you could go and preach the cross. The Most High, the creator of all things, wouldn't send Paul to go out and lie. You got to understand that this is not a God talking. You got to look at it like this. Take the movie 300 as an example. Xerxes in the movie basically did his vows and then walked into the water. When he came back out the water, you know, he was a tall, big, golden guy looking like a god, you know? That's Xerxes right there. So when Leonidas throws the spear at his face, it cuts him. And at that point, you learn that he is no god. He's a regular man. He's still that same king. But everybody around looks at him like he's a king. And, you, and, and many times in the movie, he even refers and says, praise me as your king and as your god. Yes. He says that several times in there. Yes. And it's the same attitude that's going on with Paul. It isn't the creator talking right here. This is a king that he praises like a god. But we're going to show that right there. We're going to prove that right there because I know that might be challenging to certain people's concept of thought. So we're going to look at verse 19. Verse 19 to see what his God say or the king that he served, because, see, we're questioning the words of wisdom. All right. Or it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So in 19, his God, y'all give him a pass. You give him a pass. It says, for, it's, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing. I just, you know, that's not your creator. That's not your creator talking right there. That is a man talking right there. That is other people pushing this king's word. We read earlier when we started this uh, lesson what wisdom was in the Old Testament. When you get to this part right here, you hear so much of someone getting a pass for talking to you not with wisdom or words, and now this God is getting a pass of basically killing off the wise, bringing to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Like, why would you want to do that right there? I was just going to ask you that, Brother Push. Why would this God King want to destroy the wisdom of the wise? What, 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 what purpose would they have by doing that? We had these uh, scripture pieces for the wise. So we're going to look at some of those pieces right <laughs> there to try to see. So we're going to go back into the Old Testament on a couple parts to try to see you know, 
what validates this king or this God to be able to kill off the wise and bring to nothing the prudent, the guy who searches. So we're going to just read a little bit. So this is Psalms 37, verse 30. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. Nothing wrong there. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 8. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. Okay. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 18. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. Okay. So this God gets to go out and kill the things that this, the first God, I guess, you know, the Old Testament, you know, because I thought this was all one God, you know. So you get different talk over here and different talk over here. And you have to understand that these aren't gods. These are men who's been vilified as, as gods. gods. And they have, un like, basically infected the scriptures. We give a pass to someone literally saying in 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wise, the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing under the understanding of the prudent. Like, why would you do that? You know, uh, 20. Um, it says, uh, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? This is someone mocking you. I was just going to say, it sounds like he's taunting them or saying, like, you know, where, where are your scribes? Where are, where are the disputers? Who, who can challenge my word? Who can challenge what I say? But here's the thing right here. You have Paul talking to you not with wisdom of words because he needs you to believe in a cross, and then he turns around and tells you, that when you believe in the cross, you go out and you perish foolishness or you basically preach the gospel to people who don't know. And that is the power of his God or the power of the king. But in order to make all this work right here, in order to make all of it work, I'm saying these kings had to go out and genocide the world. Like it, when you say... For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. To be wise and have wisdom means that you've been around for a while. Anyway, so you know some things. So if you destroy the people that could pass on your history. Your elders, your, your elders. ancestors. I love all your ancestors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is someone who goes and kills off the ancestors. Because when you kill off the wise and the wisdom, that is someone who is older than you all day. That's someone's older than you all day. It says right here, has not, this is still in 20, has not God made foolishness the wisdom of the world? Well, in order to make the world foolish, you have to kill off what? The wise. So then the children who are left, they don't know anything. They are the ones who are now the foolish because you just killed off the wise. You just killed off the prudent. And then you said, where is your scribe? Well, you killed them. Where's your disputers? You killed them. Okay, I, I, 21, Corinthians 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So it says right here in 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. If you kill off the ancestors who knew that you was a king and not a, a god, god, okay, okay. If you kill off the ancestors, I'm pretty sure you'll be able to say it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. See, it, it, it sounds like a man. I see it now as you as you get into that and you say that he was pleased by the foolishness because the he knew the king knew the king knew. But the people that were being preached to the children, they did not. Know. They did not know. So then when you look at that again, it says 
For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, because this God, this king, this God king killed off every wise person who would be able to rebel against him. He killed off any disputer who would be able to argue with whatever doctrine that he's coming with. He's killed off anybody who would dispute. Okay? So now he's sitting here and it says, and it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Well, the ones that believe were the babies. When you killed off the mother, the father, the grandfather, and the kids are left, they are the ones that are considered to be foolish. And they are the ones that they saved. Why? Because those are the ones that are being retrained. Those are the ones that they save and reteach to follow in their way. So those that are being saved are the children. That's what's being saved right there. It's not saved as in Jesus came and saved you from Satan. This is not that right there. This, this is, is a man or a God or a God king who has went out and killed the wise of the world, that's killed the wise of the world, that's killed anybody who will argue or dispute. They, This guy did this right here. So it just brings to a, a, a real understanding when you start looking at, say, 22, after, you know, him being happy with the foolishness of preaching to those that believe, which were the children. You kill off the wives, there's no one left but the children. And the children will be foolish because there's no one to teach make them. them wise, to teach them. And if your enemy comes and teach them a new doctrine different than their ancestors, that's where we are right now. Everybody in the world has been conquered to the point of genocide. And our ancestors is gone. And we talk a talk that not even our ancestors talk. I don't care what nation you in. I'm pretty sure you talk a talk that your ancestors, say, 500 years ago, wasn't even uttering out of their mouth. You know, but we'll go and we'll look at 22. We're going to roll through this one. 22 and 23. Interesting. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. It says right here, for the Jews require a sign. And right here in our book, the King James Version, it has this T next to Jews and require. And that T right there says, want a miracle. For the Jew require a sign. Or for the Jew wants a miracle. And the Greek seeks after wisdom. I want you all to pay attention to that. The Jew wants a miracle. The Jew wants a miracle. This is how twisted they are. Okay. 23. But we preach Christ crucified. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. 23. Corinthians 23. But we, pre but we preach Christ crucified Unto the Jews, a stumbling block. It's, there is a T right here, right between Jews and A. And that means an occasional scandal. We, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block or an occasional scandal. What was the stumbling block or the occasional scandal? Well, the stumbling block was Jesus dying on a cross. The stumbling block was Jesus dying on a cross. So the thing that we're arguing is that no one died on the cross. But the Jews, meaning you, believe that Jesus died on the cross. So that's the stumbling block that they have given to the world, that this man was murdered. This is the scandal. But the problem is there's scripture that says that he was hung from a tree and not from a cross, you know? And then if you go deeper with Jesus, you can't even determine his birthday. I mean, is it in March or is it in April or is it in December, you know? So this is the scandal because you can't prove exactly what you know. 
in the Bible, I'm going to read or have read three parts where it talks about him being hung from a tree. Now, you're being taught in the church that he died on a cross. And if, if the Bible is saying he was hung on a tree and the minister is saying he died on a cross, that is a scandal. That is a stumbling block because someone is playing with the death of what one would consider to be the Holy Son. You know, this starts to create this, this confusion. So we're going to read three parts. Brother Fitz. So this comes from Acts chapter 5, verse 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Acts chapter 10, verse 39. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem whom they slew and hanged on a tree. On a tree. And lastly, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Pause. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Okay, your minister tells you every Sunday that he died on a cross. But I just showed you scriptures where it says he's died hanging from a tree. That is a scandal. When we go back and we look at, when we look at 23, Corinthians 23. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Do you hear it? But we preach Christ crucified but we preach christ crucified on a cross i just showed you him being hung from a tree so this man just like i told you from the beginning he said he wasn't talking to you with wisdom of words so he's telling you because he wants you to believe in the cross when you believe in the cross you're going to go out there and you're going to teach it to other people and this is what he wants you to do. And I'm saying there's a king that's actually he follows that he looks up to as a god. And then this king brags and talks about how he destroyed all the wisdom in the world, all the wise. And he's happy about the foolishness in the world. The wise had kids. And those kids is the ones who were retrained. That is us. That is not just even black people. That's that's everybody that is uh, underneath the European crown. I'll be, be all honest with you, and I'll show you why I said that. But we're going to look at um, we're going to look at twenty four. Twenty four. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Now we started this off with someone talking to you not with wisdom of words. We got a God that Paul follows that is destroying wisdom. We got the Old Testament that is like wisdom is light. <laughs> so, so my question, Brother Push, is he's telling two different stories to two different people about this God king. And he's, and he's, so he's going out, would you say he would be spreading confusion? No, well, he's spreading confusion, but it's not really two different stories. I mean, to be honest with you, even if you, like, look deeper into it, like um, uh, Corinthians 23, you know, but we preach Christ crucified onto the Jews, a stumbling block. So they preach the scandal of Jesus' death. And then it says right next to it, and on to the Greeks' foolishness. Well, here's the thing about the Greeks. When we go to college, you're going to Greek society. When you join a sorority, you're joining Greek society. The Greek society thought is the Illuministic thought that is meant for everyone to be subdued under. So underneath this thought right here, which is Greek thinking, 
If you're under Greek thinking, then you are foolish. You are foolish because you're underneath their thought. I mean, you got to really look at it like this. It is the Greek scholar, you know, who writes the scriptures. It is the Greek, yes. the Greek scholar who gives you your math. But we know that there is ancient math that is different than the math that we get. You see what I'm saying? So quite possibly your ancestors knew of a math that was probably more simpler to understand than what we have even right now. But when you have a king go out and kill all the wise in the world, that means I'm going into your land, I'm killing everybody off, I'm just leaving the women and the children alive. I'm killing anybody strong off. So if it's a strong woman, she's going to get killed. When you kill off the wise in the world like that and leave only the children like that, then you're able to retrain. And I want to make one point on the movie 300. Uh, he kept stressing that if they did not serve him, that basically he would erase their history from basically he would erase them from history and he would not even allow anybody the, the saved to ever mention or bring up these these particular people ever again or you could die from that. So um again that authority yeah. put of that God King, you know, if you don't serve, then we'll just erase you from history and no one will ever know about you. That is real. You know, so basically, you know, Paul says in this whole thing that He's not preaching the gospel to you. He needs you to praise the cross. He needs you to go out there and preach the cross. His God on the other side of this is going to be going and killing off all the wise. In order for Paul's job to work, he had to go and kill off what? The wisdom, the wise, the prudent. In order to make it easier for Paul to go out there and be able to preach this, he preached this to people whose forefathers were gone. And they didn't know nothing else. So it's easy to preach Christ Jesus hung on a tree, died on a cross, whichever. One, to people who don't have their own forefathers to guide them. Because we don't understand. And we'd be like, well, uh, they only came here to uh, Africa or something. No, the Europeans conquered everybody. If there's a church in where you are at, your place has been conquered. You know, so we have to understand the Knights Templar, when they went down, they didn't give everybody hugs and sung <laughs> songs. They were down there killing people, Absolutely. you know, and people were fighting them back. So that's a great point, Brother Push. It, it is real. But we didn't did all this right here to come to this one piece. We want to show who has written Paul's line. Because, like I said, the creator of all things is not going to have anyone go out and lie and deceive people into believing in a sign, a symbol, or anything of that nature like that. His power is so divine, or her power is so divine, or the essence of this creator is so divine that plants grow no matter what, no matter what's built on it. The sun, it sits in this position, and we can't understand why it's there. This is great. And that which made those things like that don't have no time to tell Paul to lie. So we want to see who is putting the words into Paul's mouth. So we're going to look at this character right here, and his name is Erebus. Dercebius. Is it Dercebius Aramis? Dercebius Aramis. Dercebius Aramis. Aramis. He was a humanist uh, who was the greatest scholar of the Northern Renaissance, so they say. Uh, and he was the first editor of the New Testament and also an important figure in uh, patristics and classical literature. So uh, as we dive into this, um, Aramis used several Greek manuscript sources because he did not have access to a single complete manuscript. Most of the manuscripts were, however, late Greek manuscripts of the Byzantine textual family. 
Okay, I want to stop right there. Most people, when they read that, they don't make this connection right here. It said, Aramis used several Greek manuscript sources because he did not have access to a single complete manuscript. It says, most of the manuscripts were, however, late Greek manuscripts of the Byzantine textual family. Now, most people don't look at where that Byzantine empire is. This is like stuff over there near Carzeria. This yeah, is like stuff right underneath Russia. Russia and all those. Okay. Okay. Where you you're like you're told that it comes out of Egypt. You're told that it comes out of North Africa. You're told that the uh, the Coptics are North Africans, you know, or at least from that northern area over there. But if you say Byzantine, I mean, I know that's an empire, but that's majority like heading towards China, heading towards Russia. And, you know, and it has some conquering as it go down. But at the heart of the Byzantine Empire is Kazaria. So it's almost like if this telling you that this Aramis dude got his scriptures from the Khazars, you know, the Byzantine Empire. It's something interesting right there. But it says um, most of the manuscripts were, however, late Greek manus manuscripts of the Byzantine textual family, and Aramis used the oldest manuscripts the least. Wait a minute. <laughs> the least? He used the oldest the least. manuscripts the least. I mean, why would you do that? And most people, when they use manuscripts, they go and they use... The oldest they could find. The oldest text, textual information they could find. That they it. can find, you know. And he said that it was because... He was afraid of its supposedly erratic text. Yeah. And he also ignored much older and better manuscripts that were actually at his disposal. So if we look down below, my mind. My mind is so excited at the thought of amending Jerome's texts with notes that I seem to myself inspired by some god. Some god, okay. I have already almost finished amending him by collating a large number of ancient manuscripts, and this I am doing at enormous personal expense. So this guy right here is telling you my mind is excited at the thought of amending Jerome's text. What is amending? Sounds like you, he's revising or rewriting. Or rewriting. You see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? With notes that I seem to myself inspired by some God. So <laughs> he wrote his own notes. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and seemed to be inspired by some God. Okay. It says, I have already almost finished amending, rewriting him by correlating a large number of ancient manuscripts. And this I am doing at enormous personal expense. This is getting ready to let you know that this guy it's the guy who wrote Paul's verse that we just read. The next line over. So it's, it also says that he collected all the Vulgate manuscripts he could find to create a critical condition. Then he polished the Latin. He declared, it is only fair that Paul should address the Romans in somewhat better Latin. We want to read that again. He collected all the Vulgate manuscripts he could find to create a critical edition. Okay, so he's the guy putting the Bible together. Right. It says, then he polished the Latin. Mm -hmm. That means that he maybe corrected the writing. Maybe try to make it sound a little more fancy. Maybe so. <laughs> maybe so. Gave it a humanistic conversation. You know, then it says he declared. He declared. It is only fair that Paul should address the Romans in somewhat better Latin. That is telling you that he is the one writing for Paul that will be addressing the Roman in a better Latin. He is the writer of Paul's verse. He is the one who wrote, I come not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words. This guy is the one who wrote that. He says, it is only fair that Paul should address the Romans in somewhat better Latin. This guy is the writer of Paul's verse. 
not the creator. So once you learn that this guy is the writer of Paul's verse, then you can start to understand that there's a king funding him. There's things over him. Ultimately, it comes to the King James Bible. So there's kings involved in this. That's how you know the kings are the gods in the Bible. And, and it's funny that he actually picks out Paul in particular, too. Yes, you know, by name. Yes, by name. But this bottom piece. So he wrote, uh, there remains the New Testament translated by me with the Greek facing and notes on it by me. <laughs> That's self-explanatory. He wrote, there remains the New Testament translated by me. There remains the New Testament translated by me. Translated by me. This guy is the one who wrote the New Testament with the Greek facing and notes on it by me. This is the guy who wrote the New Testament. It's like saying, I got this new pair of Jordans with the Nike sign on the side, sign by me, Michael Jordan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people, like, this is, this is something big yes. that a lot of people don't pay no attention to right mm -hmm. here is that when we looked at what we read over there with Paul, it sounds so messed up and decrepit, but we just showed you. Who wrote it? Who wrote it? See, that's why I said it isn't the most high talking. His essence is so great. There is no way he's going to send a single man to go out and just lie like this. No, that Paul follows a king. But I'm saying if Eusebius wrote this, Eusebius, Aramis wrote this, it makes you question, is Paul even real? Because he wrote it. Maybe Paul is real, and he didn't took and rewrote this guy's writing. I'm open to it, but all I'm saying is, is verse 17 of Corinthians is written by this dude. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. but we're gonna uh, we're gonna check something out right here. So, okay, we're gonna go and we're gonna really put a, a worldly spin onto this right here. So, no. No, well, well, you know what? You know what? Let's look at that. Let's look at that. Uh, the, the authority of the Bible? Yes. Okay. Let's look at that book right there. Yeah, you lay people, we got books around us. <laughs> well, let's look at that one. Let's do that one. So this one is uh, the authority of the Bible uh, written by George W. Reed. Is it true? The most faithful source is the Textus Receptus compiled by Aramis and used as the basis for the Luther Bible, French Bible, and the King James English Bible? Keep going. While at one time this was probably correct, it is no longer the case. In creating the Textus Receptus, Aramis, although a great scholar, had access to only eight manuscripts, all from the so-called Benzantine family of biblical manuscripts. Okay, so... Different source. Different source. And this is saying that he only had eight scripts and another piece well they didn't say how many he had they just said he he, he went out and got a lot of pieces at great expense mm -hmm. to himself but this in this book right here you know it's saying that he had only eight manuscripts and he got them from the benzantine and if anybody goes and research that that is the causars that is that what one would say okay the fake jew or whatever he went and got that, what we're reading right now in the New Testament, from them. It doesn't come from uh, the Coptics, unless the Coptics is from northeast of Europe, you know? That is what's important right there. But we're going to look at something a little bit different to bring this to uh, a, a big understanding. What I've been trying to say is what we just read in the scriptures is what a king told a scholar to write. And the scholar wrote it in a humanistic way. But it was a real plan. It was a real plan. The Europeans, because this, this guy is a European, so his king is European. And them European kings, basically, basically, the European kings basically went out there 
and ordered their kings or, or like not kings, but ordered their priests and knights to go and take land. You know, um, when they came to take your land, they killed off the wives when they came to take your. I mean, think about it. Wherever you're from in the world. If the Europeans came to your land, your people experienced some form of genocide to where your population is now all young people. You know, in order to get a population where it's all young people, somebody had to kill off all the older people, you know. So I'm wanting to show that their plan has really went into play. Their plan really has went into play right here because the king said he killed off all the wise, all the prudent. That's what the God says. I'm saying after they killed all the wise and the prudent, their order, which is that luministic, messianic order, that Jesuit order, they did the retraining. But it's funny where you will find them telling the truth like they did in the Bible. So we're going to look at uh, what Rockefeller said. John D. Rockefeller, senior quote, in our dreams, people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hands. The present education conventions of intellectual and character education fade from their minds and, and unhampered by tradition. We work our own good will upon a grateful and responsive folk. We should not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of science. We have not to raise up from them authors, educators, poets, or men of letters. We should not search for great artists painters, musicians, no lawyers, doctors, preachers, politicians, statesmen, of whom we have an ample supply. We want to stop right there. If y'all notice, it was a lot of nots. We will not. We shall not. We will not. We have not. Brother True, read from us a couple nots, just any one of them. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers. We shall not. Make into them philosophers. Keep going. Or men of science. Or men of science. See, your ancestors who knew this stuff was killed off. You're the kid left. Keep going. We have not to raise up from them authors, educators. There you go. Poets. There you go. Or men of letters. Keep going. We shall not search for great artists, painters, musicians, nor lawyers, doctors, preachers. Stop. Preachers, preachers, how do you know that the preacher that you go to on Sunday does not do the work of this order? Because I showed you from the Bible standpoint, because this is written by a man, that the order was to go out and kill everybody in the lands and leave only the children and retrain them. And they succeeded because the Rockefellers is telling you right now. And they're telling you they supply even your ministers. Well, you'd be like, my minister isn't a part of this. If he went to a Jesuit school, then he's a part of it. They have retrained everybody from kids after they killed off the adults. So we want to look at this picture right here. We want to look at this picture right here. It's an older picture. but And, and, and I want y'all to, Brother Fitz, to read the bottom caption so you can understand that they killed off the elders and retrained the kids. So it says, emancipated slaves, white and colored. The children are from the schools established in New Orleans by order of Major General Baines. Okay. It says, emancipated Banks. slaves. And correction, General Banks. Sorry. Banks. Mm -hmm. Emancipated slaves, white and colored. White and colored. Look, you kill their parents off. You kill their parents off. You kill the, the elder off. You take the kids, you retrain them. These kids are slave kids. You see where their hand is. Look where the guy's hands are. Those are messianic gestures right there. And these are slave kids doing messianic gestures. And what I'm saying is, is highly likely their parents, which was the wise, were killed off. Which was the prudent, was killed off. Which was the disputer, was killed off. And the people who were saved is the kids. That's what that Bible was talking about, and this is what has literally happened in the world today. 
Well, once again, Brother Push, I do appreciate you allowing me to be on this podcast, man, and share the knowledge with, with the world. Um, the subscribers have been growing so much. We thank everybody that has subscribed to the page, everyone that has left a comment uh, and that has supported the political puff. Also, don't forget puffview.com. Uh, the website. Please make sure you go there. Check us out. Again, so much love. We love everybody that has supported us, that has shown uh, uh, the, the upvotes, the, the the likes, everything, man. We really appreciate it. Uh, Brother Push, uh, Brother True, and I am L.A. Fitz. We are out. <laughs>